Okay. So, this is coming from Second Peter, from verses 1 to 9. And I will read it first, so if we can get there, before we continue. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According to his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue whereby I give in unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, and by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence and to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see far off, and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So we we'll move back from, to the one, and then I'll go through. What Paul, or Peter, rather, is telling us, is trying to encourage us to lead godly lives. And this is the way that we have to keep on growing in our faith. He reminds us that God has provided everything for us that will help us to be able to do that. So, when we look back again at the verse 1 and 2, which is the foundation of the Christian life, Peter first identified himself as a servant and at the same time as an apostle. So what he's doing is that he's trying to bring something out. As a servant, what do we see? What he's telling us that he's not speaking for himself. Whatever he's doing, he's doing it as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the attitude that we should try and, I can say, follow or emulate. In a way, all Christians, we are on the same plane, that our relationship with God is based on the Lord Jesus Christ. So, what I would say is, as far as the Lord is concerned, a pastor doesn't have a special right to God than any one of us. Neither is the prayers of a prophet more powerful than your own prayer. Because we all get through the same source. So that is what Peter is bringing up. And he's a servant, that is the first thing we have to look at, that in all things we should consider ourselves as servants of Jesus. And then through that, um, behave accordingly, if you like. And he also brings in the second part, that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. The reason why he's mentioned that he's an apostle means that it's somebody who has been divinely appointed as a witness of Christ's resurrection to carry the message which is infallible. That means that whatever he says, is just like Jesus saying it, and it's just like God saying it. So it carries authority. So what he's saying that, what I'm going to tell you, it's coming from God. It's just like God speaking, so you better pay attention. This is the reason why nowadays it's so dangerous for many people calling themselves apostles. Without regards to the implication of it, something which hasn't been done 
nearly willy for over 2,000 years, but recently it has become a fashion. When they call themselves apostles, are they telling us that their word carries authority of God? I'm sure if you ask them, they will say no. But from the Bible, that is the implication. Then he goes on to tell us that all of us, including him, the apostle, we've all obtained faith which comes from the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. So what he's saying is that the gift of faith is not from us. It's something that God has given us. And that gift of faith is based on the righteousness of Christ. So he's trying to make sure that we understand, including him, that there's no distinction or ranking among believers. There's no first class and second class Christians. The faith that we have it's a common faith for all of us that is derived from the Lord Jesus. It's a gift that God has given us. It's coming because of the righteousness of Christ. So that is important that he wants us to pay attention to. How do you feel that the faith that you may have, you may say that I have great faith, but this faith that you have is somebody's, if I can say, poverty. When we live in a world where achievement is what counts, as success is measured in achievement, how do you feel about that? Let's think about it. We should always remember that we've come to Christ not because of ourselves, but because of something that God has done for us. Then when we go to the verse 2, he talks about grace and peace be multiplied unto us through the knowledge of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. See, what is Peter saying? Or in that sense, he's speaking for God. That grace and peace should be multiplied unto us. So he's calling us to have an abundance experience of grace and peace. Peace, one way of it, we have peace with God and we should also have inner peace. And grace also means that we have to recognize that God has given us unmerited favor and he has given us some abilities to be able to live our life. What he's saying that these things should be multiplied unto us, it should be abundant. But how will it happen? He says it only happens through knowledge of God and Jesus Christ our Lord. So here he is trying to say that if the peace and the grace of God will work in our lives, will multiply as he is wishing us, then it has to come from our knowledge of God, that we must know God. We must know the ways of God. If we know that, we're going to have the peace, we we'll harness the peace and the grace that God has given to us. So in effect, what he's saying is that, yes, we should have international knowledge about God, but we should also have a deep and personal, glory, growing relationship with God. This means that we should be committed to our spiritual growth. If we know God, then our life will be full of peace and the grace of God will be experiential in our lives. So what it means is that the measure of maturity of a Christian is based on how we grow in grace and peace. So the more they multiply on us, the more we know that we are on the right track. These are qualities that everybody really is looking for. But Peter is telling us that if we are going to have that, 
the peace and the grace to be able to do well and we must have a good relationship with God. I want us to think about this and ask ourselves, are we intentional about growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or we just consider ourselves as Christians and then we forget about everything. That I'm good, I'm going to heaven. So, okay. We should also ask ourselves, are we experiencing greater peace and grace? If not, Peter is telling us what we should be doing. Go back to the Bible. Have good fellowship with Christ. And then you have peace. So if you want to have an abundant peace, that is how we should be behaving. Then when we come to the verse 3, it's giving us God's provision for godliness in this sense. So here, it says, according to his divine power has given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So the knowledge has come in again. But first, what he mentions is he talks about the power of God. That God is divine power has given us everything we need. And that power is for a purpose. It's for a life of godliness. What is godliness in that sense? It means that we will fear God or we will revere God, we will be loyal to God, and we will be obedient unto God. So when we hear people talking about their own power, power, God is telling us that this is what the power is for. It says that you revere God, it says that you will be loyal to God, and he said that you be obedient unto God. It is not for miracles. It is for reverence of the living God. Miracles, I would say, is, um, as the doctors would say, side effect. But the purpose of it is to be able to have a godly life. But he's telling us that the ability to have godly lives comes from God's own strength. It comes from God's unlimited power. So he's not leaving us alone to be able to revere God, to be able to be loyal and obedient unto God. But he says that God has given us, he has his ability available for us to be able to do that. And if you want to think about it, that is the power that created the whole universe. And that raised Jesus from the dead. So, if you should ask why does it matter? It matters because one way, if we try to live these godly lives through our own strengths, we will fail and be frustrated. But if we know that God's power is working in us, then we will have the confidence and we have the hope to live a life that will please him. Let's think about it again. Do we often depend on our own strength to live out our faith or rely on God's power? It's also talking about that everything we need Here in King James, he says all things in other uh, translations, he talks about everything we need. So here Peter is emphasizing that everything we need for this godly life is available. There's no missing pieces in this. Whatever challenges we are facing, God has already equipped us 
with the necessary tools to overcome it. So, but first we have to have the knowledge of him so that we are aware of these things. Then whatever he's told us, we'll be able to appropriate them. So if we can have the strength to resist temptation, to be able to have wisdom to navigate difficult situations, be able to have endurance to stay, God says that his power is complete for us. That if we rely on him, we'll be able to do it. So, we should have confidence that God has already provided everything we need for this godly life. Then come again about the knowledge that he talked about previously. And these things we can appropriate them only if we have the knowledge of God. If we have the understanding of God's ways, then it will be well with us. If we have intimate relationship with God, then divine doors will be opened unto us and will be able to tap into all the resources. So, in effect, spiritual growth isn't automatic. It flows from knowing God personally. We need to invest time in scriptures, prayers, fellowship, to deepen our knowledge of who God is and to know his ways and his will. Amen. Let's ask ourselves again, how are we growing in the knowledge of God? What steps are we taking to cultivate a deeper relationship with Christ so that we will be able to use whatever he has provided for us? Then he also talks about, um, we should move to the third place. He's also talked about glory and virtue. What glory is he talking about here? Since he wants us to be like Christ, it should be the glory of God. One thing we have to recognize, as the faith told us, that we've been called solely because of God's glory and goodness, which he wants to be reflected here. It is based on God's character, which is full of beauty, majesty, and perfection. So it is not anything in the eyes why we are called. So that when you can easily twist it around um, with something, that is why God has called me. That is not the case. If you look at the Bible carefully, He says He's called us just because of Himself, not anything that He sees in the earth per se. So we should recognize that our calling to live a godly life something which is rooted in God's own nature and not in our own abilities or worthiness. So, talking about also virtue, If we're looking at God's side, God's glory and virtue is not something which is abstract. He has demonstrated through Christ that Jesus was able to live a sinless life and he died for our sins. That is something that he wants us. So if we want to live a life of glory and virtue, that is the direction we should be looking at.
we'll come back to the virtue again, but let's go to verse 4. So here is saying whereby we are given exceedingly great and precious promises. So, what is the purpose of God's power in our lives to help us to live a godly life? Because of this, he's saying that, how are we going to deal with that? He says, to know God, we should consider the promises that he has given us. He characterized the promises as great and precious. So it's something that we should not take for granted. These promises, I can name a few. That is eternal life, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of our sins, promises that God will work all things together for our good. You can get more from the word of God. But these promises, he says, they are precious. And it will only become great in our lives if we know the ways and the will of God. I would say the foundation of our faith and our ability to trust in God. If we know that his promises are precious and he doesn't break his promises, then we will have the strength to pursue godly life. Let's ask ourselves, do we daily rely on the promises of God as we live our lives or as we go through our routines? Do we hold on to these promises when we face challenges? These are questions that we should think about. And he says that if we pay attention to the promises, then we will partake in the divine nature. This is a profound statement. But people tend to twist this and try to call themselves that they are little gods. We are not gods. We don't become God. What he's talking about is that we will be transformed and become more and more like Christ in our character and in our conduct. God's power which will be working in us will help us to grow in love, patience, kindness, and all the other virtues which will come very soon from verse 5. So when we embrace God's promises, will be empowered to live like Jesus Christ. And when we to live like Jesus Christ, oftentimes we think about the miracles, but God is interested more in character. We can share in his nature and then escape the corruption of the world. So that is what happens, comes for us to know the emphasis. The divine nature is so that we will escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. So Peter is pointing out that promises of God will help us to move away from moral decay and corruption that is the characteristics of this world. That is what the power of God does. And I repeat again, the power of God is not for miracles. It is said that we will escape the corruption that is in the world. When we know that he's working in us, when we know that his divine power is available, we will be able to do this. The divine nature of God It's based on some virtues that we'll soon be looking at. But the world, as we know it, is this filled of greed. It is filled of lust. 
It is full of selfishness. It is full of pride. This causes brokenness and all problems that we are encountering here. But God says that if we take what he has given to us, then we'll be able to have the divine nature so that we'll escape this corruption that is in the world. So, if we follow God properly, as believers, we'll be set free from the corruption that is in the world. Those vices I just mentioned here will happen less and less in our lives and hopefully not appear at all. So, moving again to verse 5. He says, and beside this, so now he's saying that for everything that he has talked about here, we've got to do something. So initially he says God has given us the faith. His power is available. We need to know God. But now he says that we've got to work. What work do we have to do? He says the beginning has been given to us, that is faith. So we have to add to the faith, we have to add virtue. What is this virtue that he's talking about here? Other translations call it goodness. So again, God is saying that if you say you are spiritual, these are the things I want to see in your life. First, I've given you the faith. The faith is for everybody. But you have to do some work. And that work that you have to do, I've already told you that every provision is there for you to be able to do it. So from the faith, move forward. Add virtue. Add goodness. So if we say we are growing spiritually, or we say we are spiritual, these are the things that it should be in our life. And the very the characteristics that is enumerated, they go hand in hand together. They are co connected. But the first one is virtue. So if we are looking at virtue or goodness, one, it requires excellence in everything that we do, that whatever we do in the other places, he says is when we are doing things. We should put in our best. That is what God expects. We should put in our best. That though the foundation is faith, we got to add goodness to it that we have to work on. Goodness also entails moral excellence. So in everything that we do, we should be thinking of to do it very well. When it comes to morality, we should be different from the world. So this should be a life which is characterized by integrity, by honesty, and by righteousness. So this is the direction that God wants us to have given you the faith. I'm giving you the tools. Make sure that everything you do is excellent. Make sure that your moral life is excellent. Your life is full of integrity. Your word can be trusted. You are honest in your dealings with people and all things. You should look at Christ, his righteousness, and reflect that. That is what God is saying. That is the virtue I need from you. If you have the divine nature, this should be your nature. So it's not only about doing good deeds, that is part of it, but it's more than that. So goodness should be evident in all our actions. It should be evident in all our decisions. It should also be evident in all our relationships. And again, let's ask ourselves, 
Are our lives marked by moral excellence? Then he moved on. That from virtue, from goodness, we got to move on again to knowledge. So what he's saying is, knowing God has to be continuous all the time. The knowledge of God, to have understanding of God, to have knowledge about even in the worldly things that we are dealing with in your profession, make sure that you really know your staff. It also involves knowing God's word and applying God's word properly, truthfully into our life. The knowledge of God and his ways should inform us of our actions and decisions. If we live wisely, it should be the direction. And that is what God is saying is spiritual. It is not seeing visions. It is not seeing dreams. It is not raising our people from the dead. Yes, those things are there. But God says that my nature is with virtue and knowledge. Then when we go to the next verse, He says, and to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience and the patient godliness. So what is God saying again? This is the nature that I'm demanding of you as my children. I've given you every provision. Now, from the knowledge, we have to have temperance, which is self-control. It is the ability to be able to master our desires, to master our passions, and to master our impulses. So that we don't respond quickly or reflectively based on the flesh. That when we are offended, we give it back straight away. Something like that, just as an example. We should have self-control. In dealing with people, we should have self-control. When we are offended, we should take it lightly. We should not respond. We should think about it. As somebody will say, if we can consider what will Christ do in that circumstance, that is something that we should. We should have self-control so that we can master our desires, passions and impulses. Have look at impulses. Passion is also there. Not everything that the world is looking for that we should be craving also. We should put a check on that. So this is also will help us to be able to stay away from temptations and other distractions which will lead us into the wrong path. So self-control will help us to resist if you like the pulls and push of sin that will try to move us away from um, the will of God. Without self-control, our knowledge and faith will be undermined by unchecked desire. Self-control will allow us to maintain focus on spiritual priorities and avoid distractions that can lead us astray. Again, let's reflect on this. What areas of our lives do we struggle with self-control? And if we do, we should go back to God for help. Then, from temperance, self-control, he goes to patience. Patience, um, looking at it, you would think it's like self-control, but other translations bring it out a little bit better. 
what is translated patience here is more perseverance than self-control. But both of them are put there so that we'll, we'll see. That perseverance is ability to remain firm in our faith, even when we face trials and temptations, when we face difficulties, when we face challenges. We will not jump immediately and say, oh, God has abandoned us. God has forgotten about me. No. This is something God says we should work on. We should work on. That is his divine nature. That reflects his nature. And with perseverance, we'll be able to continue trusting God and living for him even when things are hard. And this reminds us that implicitly is telling us that the Christian life is not free from hardship. You face them, but God expects that when we do, we still remember that He is the Lord, the God of all flesh, and keep hanging on. It is essential for maintaining our faith and growing in godliness even when life gets tough. Let's ask ourselves again the question, how do we respond when we face difficulties? Do we stay in? Or do we give it? Or try to cut corners? God doesn't want us to do that. And then, it says that to patience, godliness. So, here again, he's talking about the necessity to revere God, which, if you like, things which will show that will be our devotion to God, our respect for His will, our respect for His ways. Godliness will shape our entire attitude towards life. If we fear God, we do the right thing. Even the psalmist says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That we should look at God, we should look at his character. And then that should be a check on us, that we will revere him. This will also reflect that we live a life of holiness. And in everything, we look at godliness of God. Godliness is not just religious practices. It is about honoring God in our daily lives, in our daily decisions, in our daily interactions. As we grow in our reverence of God, our lives will reflect His holiness. Let's move to after godliness, go to verse 7. And in godliness, brotherly kindness. So, moving from the fear of God that we should try always to remember, he's saying that we should have mutual affection or brotherly kindness. What does that mean? It means that we should show love and care and concern for our fellow Christians and in fact for all human beings. It is something we should be practical, showing that indeed we are of Christ, indeed we have the divine nature. So Christianity is not living in isolation, but as believers we are called that when we live in a community, we support, we encourage and help one another. So it ensures that we connect to others in a meaningful ways and we reflect the, Christ, the love of Christ in all our relationship and interaction. Again, let's ask ourselves, are we practicing kindness and affection towards one another? Are we building strong and loving relationship with other Christians? 
Then from brotherly kindness, he moves on to charity, which is love, which we know from Corinthians that it is the highest of all the virtues that have been narrated here. Do we show the love of Christ in ourselves? Is that what people call agape love? Selfless, sacrificial love that reflects the heart of God. The reason why Jesus came, that type of love that God wants us to have. And elsewhere we'll find the characteristics of that. So, the apex of spiritual growth in that sense is love. God is telling us that we should have things right. If we say somebody is spiritual, these are the things that God is looking for. He's giving us the tools Everything is available. These are the things that we have to work on to grow more and more in it. So the virtues that we've talked about here, they build on each other. Faith serving as a foundation, goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection and love. This is the progression of spiritual growth. It doesn't happen overnight, so don't beat yourself down if things are not all working for you. It's a work in progress. That, but we must show results in that sense. These qualities should become more and more evident in our life. It is not a one-time event. It's a lifelong journey. But we should always be looking at this. This is what God wants. If I say I'm a Christian, these are the things that I should be looking for. These should be in my life. If it's not, I need to work more. More or less, you can look at it as a checklist to make sure whether we are improving in those areas that we are not doing well. Then when it comes to verse 8, and nine is going to bring in the check. For if these things be in you and upon, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is he saying here? If you want to measure your growth, your spirituality, and these things, the virtues that we've talked about here must be increasing in our life. It's not enough to have them. It has, they have to be increasing. So the Christian life, I would say, is dynamic, not static. If we grow actively in these qualities, then it means that it says that we will be fruitful and effective. In other words, we will not be barren. Our lives will have impact for Christ. It will reflect Christ, reflect Christ and its impact on others. If we don't grow in this direction, we risk becoming unproductive. Just knowing about Christ without leaving out this truth that has been mentioned here means that we are barren, we are unfruitful. So if we are growing spiritually, this should not be stagnant. This will ensure that if we have productive life for Christ, if we have impact for Christ, then these virtues should be increasing. We have to work on this. Then when we look at the verse 9, it says, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see far off, and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. 
So, if we don't have these things we've talked about, God is saying that we are blind. If I can go too far, I can say we are spiritually dead. Yeah, that is to the extreme. But what he's saying that you are spiritual, you are blind. You are living, but you don't see it. We become short-sighted and we'll be focused only on the present and then we lose sight of eternal realities of God. That also means that we forget our identity as Christians. When we stop growing, we forget that the transformative power of Christ is working in us. We lose sight of the grace that we are saved. And that will result in life that is completely contrary to God. Again, let's ask ourselves, are we remembering and leaving the power of Christ? Or have we forgotten the significance of the salvation that we have in the Lord? Spiritual growth will keep us focusing on these things that Christ will be glorified. And if I come to the conclusion, the Christian life is a journey. It requires continual growth, something empowered by God, it's divine power and promises. Our faith is a precious gift that God has given us. But it is the beginning of the Christian life. It is the beginning of spirituality. God has already provided everything to help us. That will reflect his glory and goodness. It is up to us to make every effort. That will help us to cultivate the virtues that Peter has listed. Faith to goodness. Goodness to knowledge. Only to self-control, self-control to perseverance, perseverance to godliness, godliness to mutual affection, mutual affection to love. Again, these virtues build on each other. And if we are diligent in it, our lives will have impact for the kingdom of God. But if we neglect it, or neglect them. We risk being spiritually blind, forgetting the incredible gift of salvation that we have received. And response. Rely, let us rely on God's power for our spiritual growth. Let us make intentional effort to cultivate the virtues which depicts spirituality and the nature of God. What is referred to as a divine nature. Let us remember our identity in Christ. Never forgotten the transformation power that is available in us to glorify God. A life which is rooted in this truth is one of purpose, one of productivity, and one of significance. Let us commit our path to spiritual growth so that we reflect the character of Christ, that we will live the fullness of life that he has called us on. Again, let us reflect. Each one should ask himself or herself, where am I in my spiritual growth? Am I making the effort to add to faith the qualities that Peter has listed? Let us ask God for divine power to help us grow in grace and knowledge and love and to commit to fruitful spiritual lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for the precious gift of faith you have given us through the Lord Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that you have provided everything we need for life and godliness. Help us to grow in our faith, adding to it virtues that will reflect your goodness and love. We also ask you that you give us the strength and the discipline to be intentional in our spiritual growth, thereby relying, O oh Lord, not on our power, but on your divine strength. Keep us from becoming spiritually blind or forgetting the grace that has cleansed us from our past sins. Let us live the fruitful and effective life, showing the world the transformation that you have brought or wrought in us. Help us to remember your promises. And may your spirit guide us in living out the fullness of life that you have called us to. Lead us, O oh Lord, to love and help to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, <clears throat> the creator of heaven and earth, we come before you today in awe of your majesty, grace, and unfailing love. We pray to you, O oh Lord, that as we live here, your blessings will be upon us. May we face the Lord. The Lord may the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May our lives be living testimony to the grace of God that we've received. May we go forth in the presence of the Lord. May the Heavenly Father continue to be our protector. May our hearts and minds be guarded in Christ Jesus. And may the Lord shield us from the snares of the enemy and keep us safe from all harm. May the angels of the Lord encamp around us to deliver us from all troubles. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. We shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. We shall live and not die, but declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. And God bless you all.